Hello and welcome to Banking Transformed. I'm your host, Jim Roos, founder and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the Financial Brand. Over the past 20 months, we have experienced personal and business transformation that has impacted every aspect of our lives. With change happening faster than ever before, we are about to experience a radical new future that is yet to be defined. In financial services, you're going to have to average, leverage data, analytics, and the human aspect and talent needed to transform forward, breaking new boundaries and meeting consumers' expanding expectations. I am so excited to have Mike Walsh on the Banking Transform show today. As a futurist, speaker, and author of the Algorithmic Leader book, Mike is going to share his thoughts on how leaders must prepare for a future that is yet to be defined. Hey, welcome to the show, Mike. You know, first off, I want to welcome you back to the Banking Transform podcast. While it seems like just yesterday that we discussed your book, The Algorithmic Leader, the world has definitely changed exponentially over the last two years. And as we discussed in the <clears throat> pre-discussion, probably never thought we'd be in this place <laughs> today, given what we were at two years ago. So you recently wrote that the sum of recent transformation and innovation not only exceeds what we've seen in the past, but that the combination of these changes pretty much lays the foundation for a new world run by new rules. Can you discuss a little bit about what your perception is of what these new rules are? Yeah, and I think really to contextualize that, uh, the way we've been <clears throat> talking about digital transformation and even digital disruption for the last five to 10 years, in truth, has really been more about digital incrementalism. You know, we talked about applying robotic process automation, uh, cost saving efficiencies, we're looking at ways to cut time, improve productivity, and maybe even cut jobs. And with the pandemic, really, all those plans for digital transformation suddenly didn't look that innovative anymore. They were just a plan for digital delivery. It was really just a, a business case for survival. And, and I think that's been the biggest shock in the last 18 months is that everything that we thought was going to be the future in 2030 ended up just being how we get through the next 12 months. And and I, I think that's had two important consequences. One, the good news is, is that it's accelerated everything. And, and suddenly what we used to have to convince people was a burning platform, everyone now accepts straight out of the box. But the other consequence, which is maybe more difficult to accept, is that that means we now need to reset our expectations about what innovation really looks like uh, because no one's impressed with you having a mobile app anymore or having a digital channel uh, or having some level of automation or accepting digital signatures uh, because let's face it if you hadn't figured out how to do that in, in the in the most recent period you're probably no longer in business you know, it, it's interesting because when you look at banking, you know, a lot of organizations, especially when COVID hit, really spent a lot of time trying to make it so people could actually do tran basic transactions on the digital device. But as you said, it's completely changed the world because of what's happened around us. You know, we're being inundated with new ways of organizations engaging and building experiences. But when you're looking at, you know, d the digital delivery, it really is not enough. What's possible today that wasn't possible, let's say pre-COVID, and what's going to be possible tomorrow with regard to digital delivery? Well, before COVID, there was still a lot of parts of the digital, uh, let's say the business ecosystem that had not been digitized, uh, whether it was parts of processes or paperwork or forms. Uh, and so what's happened during the last 18 months is that pretty much everything has now been digitalized, has been added to the cloud or to the network. And so now it's out there and, and it exists as data that can be interpreted and it can be analyzed. The other big thing that's changed that has nothing to do with COVID is just the pace of learning and acceleration around artificial intelligence, around algorithmic design, around the price of computation, uh, access to cloud services. So this has continued to improve exponentially. Now, when you put those two things together, so now you've got a much more digitalized ecosystem and you've got a lot more computational power available at, a, at cheap prices. Now we can start with a clean sheet of paper and we can say, okay, Rather than just trying to uh, digitalize our existing business, what if we start with a clean sheet of paper? What really is a bank? 
you know, what are people really trying to achieve here? Um, how do we rethink uh, presenting risk and reward to the consumer? Uh, if we stop trying to sell them a product or service, what are they really trying to achieve at different life stages? And can we engage them in a much more hyper-individualized, hyper-personalized way at scale? Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, every consumer, once COVID hit, started understanding the dynamics of what's possible with digital. From Netflix being able to determine <laughs> what you watch next to well, Zoom. Well, they got spoiled, right? Oh, yeah. You know, because all the other aspects of their life other than their financial services provider was giving them amazing experiences personalized with data. Well, and, and as you talked about, the the application of data and AI and everything else, you know, from, from when you order groceries to them understanding some of the dynamics of how you wanted them to be, much like Amazon understands the pace at which you buy things, we've really gone from moving transactions to creating experiences and even going further and to trying to build engagement. How important is that going to be for every organization, not just the banking organizations, to do more than just the basics, to make it so that it's actually what you want to pick up at the end of the, at the beginning of the day is actually pick up and engage proactively with your organizations you work with? Honestly, if, if, you, if you really break it down, the, the best kind of engagement is when you actually don't pay attention to the engagement. It's almost counterintuitive. I, I think we're at this interesting moment where we can actually start to ask ourselves what characterizes a true AI-powered organization. It, it isn't the technology stack. It isn't how many servers they've got in the cloud. It isn't how much data that they're managing. What defines an AI-powered organization is the quality of experiences it can deliver for its customers and its stakeholders. I mean, if you look at companies like, and we're talking about this before, Spotify, Uber, Netflix, what they have in common is that they've done an amazing job shifting the customer's focus from the underlying transaction to actually the experience. And the best example of this is just the fact people can't recall the transaction. I mean, what did you pay for your last Uber ride? I mean, you have no idea. Uh, what do you spend on average in Netflix if you take your monthly subscription cost and divide it by the number of movie or TV shows uh, or the number of songs you listen to on Spotify? I mean, it's a, it, it, it sounds like a crazy question, but five, year, five or 10 years ago, I bet if I asked you how much you spent on CDs this month, you'd know. And, and that's what's really happened as we've started to move into this realm of algorithmic experiences where companies are leveraging artificial intelligence and data to really create these feeds of hyper engagement you don't the transaction is not important and, and that's well, a great place to be from a value perspective well what's interesting too because it it's all about making our lives easier you know i'm on holiday right now and and we've been going to different restaurants but we're trying to remember we're going to a place that we've been before so how do we figure out what we liked and what we didn't like? Well, we're going to open table to say, geez, what did we visit last time? And what did we put down as our ratings? <laughs> and maybe in at one instance, I forgot how to spell the restaurant that we went to, but we were able to access through through open table. Now that's just a little example, but as you said, with Uber, you know, when I try to find out, you know, geez, where where was I even, you know, two months ago, I follow my Uber receipts to go, oh, that's right. I was in Boston that week. So, you know, when you look at data and AI and analytics in general, they have the ability to make better decisions, better products, create better experiences. What's the difference between being data-driven and data-led? You know, you referenced that in a couple of your presentations you've done recently, as well as in your writing. I think the real difference is, is that being data-led um, allows you to essentially take that creative further step and, um, and really launch new opportunities. I mean, to your example of open table and restaurants, I mean, that's very useful. They, can, they know you as a customer, they can make better suggestions. But let's be honest, we've had that since the late 90s when Amazon first started recommending books. But what's happening now, which is even more interesting, is like if you look at Uber Eats, Uber Eats in the last couple of years has launched thousands of restaurants themselves. Now, I don't mean they've gone down and they've got a lease and they've, you know, done an expensive fit out. What Uber Eats does is that they look at the data about what people are searching for. So let's say in Austin, people have suddenly start searching for Thai fusion Tex-Mex. God knows why you would, sounds disgusting, but maybe there's a critical <laughs> mass of people that want that kind of food. So what Uber will do is they'll, they'll literally go and start a virtual restaurant. They'll launch it in a ghost kitchen, which is a giant warehouse 
full of food preparation uh, that is not tied to a physical location. And they'll launch this restaurant and they see if there's demand, if it works, they'll expand the resourcing. So, you know, you, you're at this point now where data is this two-way uh, relationship. Not only can you use it to personalize what you offer to the customer, you can actually use it now to generate entirely new products and services as well. You know, the whole product and service area is really untapped, certainly in financial services. You know, we're still looking at organizations that pretty much when they're using data and AI, they're using more from a security and risk perspective. They're using it for an efficiency perspective as opposed to really, even though we talk about a lot, trying to make the customer's experience better. So when you're talking about building digital engagement, you know, and using tactile inter interactions in the, on your mobile device, what do you, how do you see the way we interact and engage with organizations in the future changing with regard to maybe voice and other dynamics where we can actually, you know, some of this going to be proactive as you brought up here that you'll have the ability yeah. to have them actually meet you. You know, again, I'm on vacation and, and realizing that, you know, where I am has been a major dynamic as to how different of my applications have talked to me everywhere from ticketing, you know, for events and things like this, that they're now saying, okay, you're here, here's some things you may be interested in, but these are all proactive. But beyond that, how do you see voice and AI moving forward? I mean, we're in a new realm now, and this is the realm of not digital design or interface design, but, but truly experience design. And unfortunately, we're going to go through a teething period where we're going to get a little over-enthusiastic about the toys at our disposal. And, you know, for me, the, the, the kind of analogy here is, I'm sure you remember, it was in the early days of desktop publishing when suddenly people got their first Mac and they discovered there were fonts. And, and, and people just went nuts. You know, they produced these documents that had thousands of different fonts on them. And it was, it was a, you know, a, a graphic designer's nightmare. You know, they say a little, no, little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Right. And, and I think this is going to happen as we start to, you know, have these new realms. Everyone's excited about the metaverse now as if it was just invented. Right, uh, and and then so they're kind of saying, okay, well, we're going to have we're going to have banks and digital services and virtual reality, and you'll go into your branch, and you know what? Probably not, because you know, once again, with any new format, you've got to say rather than trying to create a, a moving escalator, a moving staircase, or a horseless carriage, we've got to think about how these new formats and mediums lend themselves to the design of new and experiences, and. You know, in the early days of the web, we were designing, um, we were designing retail e-commerce things that we actually were pushing a physical cart, physical cart through an isometric kind of environment because we were trying to recreate the uh, the the aisle. And then we then we realized actually it's two dimensional. You know, there's a smarter way of doing this. So as we start to have voice and we have augmented reality and we have some of these new technologies, for me, the guiding principle is not how many toys can we use simultaneously, but how do we make this as natural as possible? How do we make the technology dis disappear? You know, Amazon Alexa has been an incredibly successful technology because my 80 year old mother can use it because it, she just talks to it and, and, it, and it understands her. And so rather than human like, it's human level. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's not trying to pretend to be human, but it understands the analog parts of us well enough to create a seamless experience. Well, it's interesting because it, you, you mentioned it here that, that we have to avoid trying to tether the future with the past. You have to completely rethink it. As you, as you said earlier, starting from a blank sheet of paper is so much more important because, you know, you look at banking. I don't want to build a brand new account opening experience that makes all the processes faster. I want to avoid the processes. You know, I, I often reference the opening of an <laughs> Apple card and where the Apple card, the first screen was, here's what we know about you. And you simply validate that that's all right. The second one was, tell me what your government ID number is. The last four digits of government ID, that's to know your customer. The third one was, tell me how much income you make. That's another validation point. And the fourth one was, here's the rules and regs, which we all just scroll through. And that was it. And you're going, it's four yeah. steps all pre-thought for you. I didn't have to input anything. You know, I, it was all there. Well, it's like, I mean, look at video <clears> games, <throat> right? I mean, if you think about it, a, a 13 to, to 15 year old is probably the most uh, demanding and, you know, savvy consumer of digital experiences on the planet today, right? You don't try and get them to read a manual, right? You, if, you've got, if you've got a game experience, you actually teach them a little bit as they go and the interface unfolds 
as it needs to. And that's that's because they've learned the hard way that if you don't design games in that way, people don't play them and you don't survive. We need that same rigor uh, in designing experiences for everything because let's face it, that generation's growing up. Uh, they've grown up listening to Spotify, to playing TikTok, uh, to playing Call of Duty or Halo, and they're going to want that same you know, intuition built into when they open up their first, I'm not going to even say account, when they begin their relationship yeah. with some sort of financial institution. Well, yeah, I have a next door neighbor that one day said, you know, can you accept a square, can you pay me through square cash? Do you know what square cash is? And I said, well, yeah, I'm in the industry. I, I know what that is. He goes, can you pay me that way? And I said, sure. And then, and then the, you know, the best question always is, you know, why? And, and even though you think you know why, and he goes, well, <clears throat> when you pay me with cash or a check, I've got to go to the bank and I don't want to go to the bank. <laughs> and you realize that that's not just one generation. You know, as we're thinking about it now, this was certainly way pre-COVID. Now you're thinking of post-COVID. There's a whole lot broader definition of what audience doesn't want to go into the branch. It ranges from the youngest to the oldest. You know, when you look at the biggest challenges in banking, I'm going to shift a little bit here to the future of work. One of the challenges in banking in every industry is, is digital technology going to replace me? You know, right now we're at a, we're at a really interesting dynamic in the um, in employment world where you know the ability to get employees is really tight. But when you look at it, there's not an employee out there that doesn't worry about am I going to be replaced by a robot? And in some cases, these people work against you with your digital transformation efforts because they say, you know, if I help you too much, I'm basically building an outplacement for myself. You know, when you look at this, how do you envision the future when you're talking about future work and employees engagement with digital technologies without being replaced? You're right. It's, it's a weird time to be talking about this subject because because actually the dominant meme is anti-work, <laughs> the great yeah. resignation, people not wanting right. jobs. What what people, and I think part of this is because there's been incredible stimulus. Everyone took that stimulus and bought Dogecoin and Shiba and some other crazy cryptos. And so everyone feels rich right now. So they don't feel like they want to, you know, drive Ubers or stack shelves at Amazon or, you know, work crappy jobs, which is fair enough. But the unfortunate side of it is it's actually accelerating automation. So, you know, I speak to my clients who work in every industry from um, nursing to hospitality to entertainment to food service. No one can find people to work. This means that they're doubling down on automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So because they can't fill these jobs, they're actually speeding up their plans to eliminate these jobs. So that's going to be a problem because at some point people realize, are going to realize they're going to actually going to need to work again. And, and I think uh, when that happens, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to basically start to define what are humans good at and what are machines good at. And it's not a once-off definition. It's going to change week to week. In a way, part of being an effective human leader or otherwise in this new environment is your ability to constantly reinvent yourself. Uh, and in fact, probably the key part of any skill of someone you want to look for in the future is someone's ability to destroy their own job, to take a kind of a meta approach to look back and go, okay, is there a smarter way of doing this? Should I be doing this work? And I don't mean should you delegate this work, but can I find a way to automate this task? And, and although it sounds counterintuitive to self-sabotage your own career, uh, that actually is probably the most useful thing that humans can do in, in the 21st century. Well, it's important because, you know, you talk about transformation. We're, we're both in a business that was very human-based. You know, we spoke on tour. We were doing all these things, but we had to reinvent ourselves almost overnight. And I know you went through a lot of iterations on, you know, what's the role of the studio? What's the role of doing a pre? Do I simply replicate what I did on stage in a studio environment? Or how's the difference? We even see in what we present being different. But when you're looking at, you know, looking at the employees and the future of work and where you're going to work, actually it all starts at the top. You know, the CEO of Lemonade Insurance once said that in a, one of our interviews on Banking Transform that the biggest hurdle to digital transformation is legacy leadership. You talk about this a lot. You talk about the, the, the importance of understanding the power of data and AI and things like this, but how different is leadership in the digital era and what skills are required by top man <laughs> from top management to be able to enable these organizations to move to the next level of what they need to do? 
There's a there's a great uh, scene in Ted Lasso, which is one of my favorite TV shows, uh, where he's I don't know if you you watch the show, but he's mm-hmm. he's playing darts, and yeah, uh, he, he you know he was talking about he's always been underestimated most of his life. People they they fail to ask you know the right questions, and uh, he he gives a quote from Walt Whitman, which is be curious, not judgmental, because. If you're judgmental, you're closed-minded, you don't see new opportunities, you don't adapt to new ways of working, you don't take in more data. Whereas if you're curious, you're open to adapt, you're open to change. And you might ask something like, does someone like Ted actually play darts every Saturday? In which case he's a total dart shark. And, and you know, uh, to me, it's a wonderful lesson because I, I think probably the single most valuable characteristic in leaders in this new world we're in isn't your ability to program or code or understand technology it's really about being open-minded and being adaptable and critically being probabilistic and and what i mean by that is is that it's it you know rather than try to be right on the time in a world where you have lots of data it's actually more useful to in a sense try to be less wrong with time this is something that professional gamblers know really well because as you get more information and more data, you can basically update your information and then you can handle uncertainty and ambiguity. Uh, so a lot of the time as leaders, we're really frightened of being wrong. We want to get all the information and we want to be 100% certain before we take a risk. But in this new environment where things are changing constantly, where we're being asked to pivot, to reinvent businesses, to change overnight, sometimes you have to be prepared to act on 60, 70% certainty. But that's okay, because sometimes by taking action in this environment, we can gather more information which can increase our certainty level. And if not, we can reverse course. Um, At Amazon, they talk about this as the difference between one-way and two-way doors. Uh, A a two-way door is one where you can easily reverse the decision, in which case you should act on much lower levels of certainty. A one-way door, you know, is a little bit more frightening. Uh, Maybe it's like strapping a bunch of people to a rocket and sending them to space. You don't want to make a mistake. So you want to be acting on 95% certainty. But honestly, very few decisions are one-way doors. Yeah. And, you know, you know, it's interesting in banking, you know, or in any industry right now, the financials, of most of these companies are, are performing quite well. How do you in how do you when you're meeting with companies that you're guiding, how do you encourage them to change when number one change <laughs> sucks? Nobody likes change. Nobody doesn't matter how futuristic you are. It, change still takes effort. And how do you encourage change when everything feels like it's working. Yeah, it's the su- success is success is often the biggest obstacle to change. I mean, because you know, not only do you have a kind of a an inner fear to rock the boat when things are going well, it seems insane to do so. And so we always have to find a, a burning platform. COVID was a burning platform for most of us because even if we'd been very successful, suddenly we were forced to reinvent our engagement channels, the way we did things, where we worked our workplaces. If COVID had not happened, uh, honestly, the whole digital transformation initiative would be 10 years behind. You know, we'd still be, we would have been talking about these things in 2027. So that made a big difference. Now we've got to find a new one. And, And for me, the next burning platform is generational change. Uh, and I think once again, this has been accelerated because you've had a whole generation who didn't go to school for six or 12 months. You know, they've, they've immersed themselves even deeper into the digital world. They did everything remote, including schooling. Uh, their parents are probably home with them. Uh, so all of this, I think has accelerated the behavioral change of that whole generation that really started to grow up during this most recent period. So it appears that disruption of all types is a new normal for business and that companies must respond with rapid innovation and rapid thinking, new thinking. We found in our research that the correlation between the organization's ability to transform and their ability to innovate really has financial ramifications. Have you seen organizations that succeeded in innovation data analytics will be more financially successful? It's one of those things that sounds so obvious <laughs> that... Uh, no one would even commission a study on it. That if you don't, if you don't pay attention to data, you're, you're certainly not going to be successful. But I, I think there's a deeper, a deeper issue here, which is, you know, what is the right way 
to leverage data and analytics to drive <clears throat> innovation outcomes. Because one thing that we I see a lot is that people invest a lot of money in technology. They, they partner with a software vendor who promises them a big increase in collaboration and productivity if everyone's got dashboards and business intelligence graphs and you know suddenly everyone's going to be uh, you know looking at real-time data and making better decisions. We spend so much time and attention on building a data infrastructure. We don't do the difficult thing, which is try to understand how to build a data culture. And that's actually quite difficult because it's not something you can copy and paste. You can't take Amazon's data culture and apply it to, um, to a completely different type of organization. Uh, I mean, there are family resemblances and there are themes that, that come across, but, but this is actually a journey that everyone needs to figure out for themselves. Actually, at some level, we're going we're gonna to hit a point where most of these technologies are commoditized. Everyone's going to have some sort of cloud-based uh, data analytics platform. Everyone's going to have access <clears throat> to cloud-based AI algorithms and prediction engines. What's going to differentiate a good company from a great one to a industry-shaking, transformative organization won't be the amount of money they spend on tech. It'll be their internal cultural operating system that they've figured out. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I'm amazed at how naive we are still about this. You know, we used to talk about Zappos being the ultimate example of great company culture. Okay, yeah, they were really nice to people, uh, you know, when, when they called up and, and, and did amazing things for service. But when you actually looked under the hood, it was kind of a little loopy in there. And, and we all, you know, know the tragedy that, that, that overcome its founder um, as well. So actually what a great culture is, is not just uh, about, um, you know, the, 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 the fun people have at the office or the, the kind of the kooky Zoom hours that people do on virtual. It's actually about the complex system of interactions that governs how people make decisions, how they interact, how they communicate, how they collaborate, and it, it's especially how effectively they can do that, you know, in a hybrid environment where some people are at work, some people are in the office. So this is all still up for grabs. Uh, we, I think during the pandemic, we, we learned the hard way how important it was, but I think many of us haven't solved this problem yet. You know, you, you talk about the, the amount of changes going on and, and the, the, the need, as we both agree, to use data analytics and AI. Are you finding that most organizations are outsourcing or partnering for that rather than trying to build it all internally? Because we, we see in the banking industry that organizations yeah. sometimes hold back on decisioning because their data is not right. You know, when a lot of organizations now can work with what I call dirty data, and apply their solutions. But are you finding that the not only the engagement of partners, but the importance of speed of getting there is more important than ever? There's a couple of issues, I think, you know, contained in what you said, which is, which is very true, Jim. Um, the first is, is that there is a lot of outsourcing going on. And, and honestly, it's dangerous. I, I can understand if you're a small organization and you're, you know, you, 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 you basically don't have the resources to build up your own data science team. But I'm seeing this in very large multinational global organizations, you know, the world's top 50 organizations. Some of these some of these players are outsourcing large parts of their data and AI capabilities. Partly it's because they want to be seen to be doing something quickly, that they're frightened, you know, of taking on the the kind of the risk of trying to deploy this themselves. But the danger is is that this None of it's in-house. None of that internal knowledge is being developed. They've still got their people working in very traditional ways, making decisions in very traditional ways. There's now just another seat on the table, which is sort of the voice of, you know, the data sphere, but it's not really deeply embedded into the way they frame opportunities and see the world. And that's a great advantage of a company like Amazon has done. Amazon... And, and people have pushed hard against it. People often find that environment difficult to work in. It's because they've not only built a data infrastructure, they've really built a data culture. And it's hard. You know, it's a, it's, it can be a confronting place to work in where you're always having to argue in the face of cold, hard data. And data is an objective, right? It isn't. Data is 
subject to biases, how it was collected, how it's used, how it's interpreted. Uh, people can be very manipulative with data. Uh, so it's, it, it's not an easy environment to work in, but it's a necessary one. Well, it's also important that we start to deploy the data. You know, especially in the financial services industry, we keep on using data analytics and stays within a, a, a department. It doesn't get deployed across the organization. And we've been talking quite a bit lately around the fact that you've got to deploy the results of your analysis to all employees so they can make better decisions, build better products, serve customers better. I, I, go, I go one step further. Arguably, even humans shouldn't be looking at the data. It should be deployed automatically into decision-making systems. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, this this is where this is where the Chinese have been uh, really extraordinary. You know, uh, and I know you've spent some time there. When you look yeah. at Ping'an Insurance and the whole ecosystem there, you know, they take data from different lines of business and use it to price risk in other parts of the businesses. Things that will get the regulators hot under the collar in the West. Uh, but it is a it is a, a slippery slope. But that is the point of the data. If you can't use data to radically reshape your operating model. If you're just creating pretty graphs for people to show to other people uh, to justify their decisions, you're really just scratching the surface of what's possible. Uh, the whole point of collecting more data and using more algorithms is that you can create new types of businesses and, and, and go after new types of opportunities. Uh, we still look at risk and in reach, a very- And reach new audiences. Reach new audiences. You know, uh, we saw this in China audience. where- it, 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 Yeah, absolutely, in ways that are, in ways that wouldn't have been cost effective before. Right, right. I mean, Goldman Sachs is doing incredible stuff with this right now. I mean, they launched Marcus. Uh, who would have thought that a 150 year old uh, Wall Street bank would launch a digital only consumer bank really that started off doing credit consolidation, right? Like it's, right. you know, who would have thought that these people would be customers of Goldman Sachs? But it's interesting, I, I interviewed the former um, uh, consumer chairman there, uh, Harit Tawa. Yeah. And I said to him, like, you know, because I, I, I did this piece for the Harvard Business Review and and uh, I said to him, you know, like, what was the secret of your tech stack? Like, how did you, how did you create a technology business inside Goldman? And he said, Mike, please, first of all, do not call us a technology company. We're not a technology business. We're a consumer solutions business. He said that the secret to our success is, is actually largely due to our organizational structure. We did a very, you know, we did a very um, a big agile organization. Everyone's part of uh, pods, which are these kind of like, you know, these teams that are focused on consumer problems. So you could be a lawyer or a marketer, but you're still part of a pod that's focused on someone onboarding a new customer or someone changing their password. So that relentless focus on constantly innovating around the customer experience, that that is what data is for. You know, it's interesting because it all comes back to data analytics and experience. And it, and it seems simplistic, but really when you're taking a legacy organization, it really takes, as you said, a cultural change. And you've written recently, and, and I've talked recently about the whole concept of building a challenger bank culture, a challenger culture, trying to change the way you do things. And you likened it to, geez, you got to be careful because you, you don't want to get into a situation that you're, you're having your midlife corporate crisis, where basically you're trying to, <laughs> trying to be the teenager when you're really the 50-year-old or older, in my case. But you know, how do you build this? How do you rebuild an organization? How do you rethink an organization? that has some great foundational aspects to it for the, the future. I, I think you really have to work, you have to do two things. You've got to, number one, see the world through the eyes of your customer. You have to follow the customer wherever they are, no mm -hmm. matter whatever weird places that takes you. Uh, and, 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 and you have to look at it through different customers as well, right? So your existing customers, your legacy customers, and your new customers, which let's face it, are your kids or your grandkids. So that's yep. the first thing. And the second thing is you've got to work backward from the future. So, you know, you might have this vision of people using augmented reality and voice systems and, you know, and you might have this incredible vision of 15 years out and it's all cryptocurrency based and uh, blockchain. But you've got to work backwards from that and say, okay, in order for that to exist in 15, 10 years time, what things need to be in place in five years time? 
what needs to then be in place in two years time so you've kind of got to work back on the foundational infrastructure the critical markets the support and buy-in from regulators from your key customer segments this is how you build a plan and a bridge to tomorrow it's it's not just creating vision statements or or, or videos you expensively produce videos about a vision of the future you've got to be quite pragmatic about what has to be put in place foundationally for these things to to happen you know apple apple's been ingenious at this and drives us nuts sometimes because you sort of know that apple knows exactly what iphone 20 should looks like but they sort of know they're not just drip feeding technologies to us they sort of know that you need a certain critical mass and a maturity around customers understanding and their use models before you can hit them with something else so we for example we know that apple's probably going to bring out some kind of augmented reality eyewear next year i just wrote about that this week so yeah yeah and you know what it's going to be okay just like the first apple watch was okay the first apple tv was okay the the fanboys are going to buy it they're going to love it everyone else is going to go don't quite get it but what they don't realize is that you have been psychologically prepared for the metaverse for years. Uh, you've been wearing devices that are measuring your vitals. Uh, you are using augmented reality and LiDAR on your iPhone and iPad. Uh, you've been catching Pokemon. Uh, you've been collecting content, uh, increasingly high levels of resolution. Uh, so you're actually being trained to do stuff in a sense, like we we're talking before, like a video game, which gives you just what you need to know when you need to know it. So this has been a long run up to something which is going to be huge. But, you know, people brought out these technologies 10 years ago and we weren't ready for them. And so they didn't go anywhere. Well, nobody wanted to wear big, big goggles. But, you know, you look, you no. look at that. You look at, look at, you know, you bring up the watch. You know, if, if you'd looked at me eight years ago, and said, you're going to wear a watch again. I go, why? I have a phone. What? 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 I, it was, <laughs> is, it that, is it that difficult to look at a phone, see what time it is? And then they made the functionality of that watch better and better. I use it every day and often every day simply for tracking fitness and for doing other things, using my voice. You know, we look at this, the future and, and we, we realize that the engagement, the experience, again, is the foundation upon which everything else is built. So I'm going to do a little bit of a pivot here and get into the whole concept that came out of it, really got in elevated during the pandemic, which is the whole issue of sustainability, including the environment, social equity and equality. How important is that going to be as far as how we frame experiences and engagement and use that in AI in the future? I, I'm not sure that they're, 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 they're so linked to the question of engagement uh, and experiences as much they're linked to uh, really a, a kind of a broad shift to, a, I, would, I would say, a value-based economy. So uh, especially for the next generation, there is this sense that corporations are not outside of the broader social debate on what is the right thing to do for the environment, for society, for <clears throat> questions of equality. And it's challenging because it's political. And it shouldn't be political, actually. That's the weird thing. Like, these should yeah. be universal. Uh, and I don't mean that in, in, a, in, a politically, in a political way. What I'm saying is, is that there are, if you look at it, in some societies, you've got very strong cities and strong councils, you know, who handle taking out the trash mm -hmm. and uh, managing sort of just like that at a community level that you're having the right housing and you don't have ugly development and you have enough trees. They're not political considerations. It's just kind of a, a shared resource that we're managing. So that kind of thinking now needs to be scaled up, you know, to corporations that are bigger than countries. And I, and I think it's a positive thing. And I think that, you know, if organizations and companies aren't proactive on that, they're going to face um, activist shareholders uh, and activist hedge yeah. funds uh, in a private equity, which is already starting, um, you know, and, and they're, they're going after uh, traditional energy companies in this way. Uh, so it's going to be a, a big part of the future of, um, you know, not just regulation, uh, customer activism, but also the way we think about investments and ETFs and things like that as well. So finally, you know, we, we realize that 
you know, you take on the role of futurist, but but everything got thrown out the window uh, two years ago. I'm I'm in Phoenix. It's it's kind of interesting. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. When the last time I was here was on March 12th of 2020. That for me will be a day in my life that lives in infamy because the day the the sports world shut down. I came out here to see <laughs> baseball in Phoenix and and get to see spring trainings I had done for 20 years previously. We arrived here. They had a little bit of a rainy day, and they said we're not sure if we're going to play. And then in, within two hours, the NC NCAA championship shut down, the baseball season shut down, everything changed instantly. So as you look to next year, Mike, what what do you see is happening that will maybe surprise us or maybe just be a transformation of where we are today? I wish you asked me this question in four weeks because honestly, I, I think uh, it's, it's very hard to call because of the increasing number of variants. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a <laughs> high probability that next year will be harder than this year and it's harder because we've had a bit of taste of freedom people don't want to people don't want to go back under control under regulations they don't want to they, they're sick of working from home they want to be out they want to be interacting human beings are social creatures they want to be shopping going to the movies they want to they want to do stuff um and they want to travel and, and at the same time all of these things are incredibly difficult right now so what i hope is that I think we're going to face a really big challenge, which is in the workplace, how do you get hybrid work to function effectively? Hybrid is much harder than in the office or all at home because the difficult thing is not the technology. We can all use Zoom now, we discovered. Uh, we've learned not to use cat filters inappropriately. Right? Um, so... But what we haven't learned is how to build a distributed organization with delegated authority that allows people to make decisions effectively without all physically being in the same place together. You know, I see people in offices on Zoom, right, trying to create a level playing field. I see people having um, in the conference rooms calling in people remotely, and then as soon as their calls are finished, the actual decisions get talked about, you know, in the room. So this is a disaster, and we're going to have to really figure out that next year. And if we can solve that, Honestly, the future of work will be a much more interesting place. You know, it's interesting. We, I've been talking recently to people, the biases of a hybrid workforce, because you think about those people that can't come into a workplace right now because it's hard to get daycare. It's hard to get other things. And invariably, there's going to be a bias because you have a situation that most of the people that need to have to work at home are going to be females and minorities. And how do you level the playing field for those people that have to work remotely without having a bias against those people that don't come in and interact in what we call the normal way? There's some interesting dynamics. The future worker, you know, as you look at it, is the, it's the foundation upon which everything else is going to be built and how fast it can move forward. So, Mike, really appreciate the time you spent with me today and, and with our audience. How do people find out more about what you're thinking, what you're doing, and what you're saying in the marketplace? Yeah, listen, it'd be great to connect with your audience. They can follow me. Uh, it's at Mike Walsh on Twitter, um, Instagram, uh, or LinkedIn. Uh, and of course, you can check out my book, The Algorithmic Leader, on Amazon or Audible. And I've got a YouTube channel as well, which is uh, actually just youtube.com slash Michael Walsh. You know, I recommend to everybody, this is something I do regularly, because if you want your mind kind of moves forward, Mike continues to do that. And he also brings it to a foundational aspect that makes it so it's not only understandable, but it's achievable. And I think that's the most important thing that that Mike has to do with, I have to do with recently, which is which is people talk a good game, but they don't move forward many times because there's pain to that and there's change sucks. And, you know, I recommend that everybody follow Mike and follow his, his YouTube channel, his, read his book, because it really gives you a foundational aspect as to what you need to do to go forward. Thanks again, Mike. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Jim. It's been a pleasure. Good to see you again. Thanks for listening to Banking Transformed. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure you follow it on your favorite podcast app. Also, if you have a chance, give us some rating as to how you enjoyed our show, because it's really important when we try to find new guests and we try to move the podcast forward. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, our audio engineer, Sean Rowe Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Maroos. Until next time, remember, as Mike Walsh said, as he quoted Walt Whitman, be curious, 
not judgmental.